the modern environmental movement as we know it really doesn't seem to be focused on ecological systems in terms of restoration and the soil. You know, it's easy to say that Chevron and Exxon is the problem and that we just need to shut down, you know, coal burning power plants. And we all need to do that and make that transition to a renewable energy and, and more, we're gaining more and more momentum. But if we do that and we don't deal with uh, the carbon cycle in the soils, we're, we're not going to come up with a, a good uh, positive future. And rice is one of the uh, major contributors uh, to, uh, it's got a greater impact of climate change than, than corn, and obviously corn's a pretty important uh, impact, especially the way we've, we're growing it uh, today with all the GMOs and pesticides and chemical fertilizers. Uh, in SRR rice, it's, instead of having the fields always flooded, it's a different way to use heirloom uh, varieties, and the water, uh, you, you'll uh, create an area, you plant, and you'll water for a period of time, and then you let the water out, um, and it uses half the amount of water, uh, and, it, and it creates a, a root system that's about five times the, the uh, regular uh, industrial rice. I really think this, there's a real opportunity to educate more people that shutting down oil and coal is important, but we need to also restore ecosystems, return that carbon back, and if we do both of those, we're going to create a, a livable, livable planet. So uh, thank you for your time, and I um, uh, hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the, uh, the speakers. One, one last thing I wanted to mention was uh, there's Soil Not Oil, I mean, uh, uh, the Kiss the Ground movie. Uh, that I'm co-producer of that's going to be coming out uh, early next year and we're going to be showing a, a trailer that you can also go to YouTube. It's called Kiss the Ground and it tells the whole story about regenerative agriculture uh, and we're, it looks like Leo DiCaprio may become our executive producer so that's going to be exciting and uh, uh, so check it out. Environment Nation is working with living systems to detoxify and regenerate contaminated environments. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to either bind the contaminants, you're trying to extract them, or break them down. And when we talk about fire remediation, we're talking about using plants, which is phyto, uh, microbes, which is working with bacteria, or micro remediation, which is fungi. A lot of times I feel like people focus on fungi and mushrooms because it's sexy, but plants and bacteria are equally sexy. And this stuff only works if you do all of it together. So I'm here to be like, it's not just mushrooms. Fire remediation, people have this idea, and I got really burnt out on this, where I would give a talk about micro remediation, an oil spill would happen, and then people would be like, awesome, I'm gonna run to a beach and throw some mycelium on the beach. And that's bullshit, because it won't work, because then the ocean's gonna come in and just suck it back, right? And so there is this need to understand, if you're gonna do this work, you gotta skill up, and you gotta learn how it works. Um, and some of the things people need to know is, fire remediation in some ways is cheaper than doing what industry does. Industry uses a lot of chemicals, or they use a lot of equipment, machinery, they like dig out all the earth, they dump it in someone else's community. That's a lot of money, and that's not always stuff that we have access to, but it is very time and labor intensive. And it does cost money if you're trying to test what you're doing and see if it actually works. You have to understand the difference between chemicals and metals. So I think why mushrooms get such a sexy rep is that they find a way to break down chemicals and people are like, ooh, it's magic, it's alchemy. Um, and it is, but metals, you can't break down metals, right? Like the lead is gonna stay that way. And so when we're working with metals, we're finding ways to either pull them out and hyperaccumulate them or bind them in a way that makes them more inert. And that's like my favorite graphic, because I was like, heavy metals. They are terrible and they will last forever, but we can find ways to work with them. But if you don't understand the difference, then you're gonna take a bunch of plants, grow them on contaminated soil, think you're a magician, and then you pulled up all the lead, and then think you can compost that down, and then put it back in your garden. And then you just kind of poisoned yourself. And that's happened on multiple sites. And when it comes to remediation, it comes to any kind of earthwork, it's important to skill up. It's not rocket science, but it is like a healing protocol. And if you're doing healing work with the body, you need to understand what's wrong, what kind of injury and illness, and then what actually works for that. And so I really recommend people take courses, people read books, people learn. You form like a bioremediation collective. You find out who the people are in your community who have mushroom skills, who are really good at composting, and you bring people together to actually be able to respond when people ask you to respond. And at the end, it's about justice. It's about making sure that we are responding to these issues and making, making a reality where people don't have to live where cancer's a given or where they can't drink their water. And I think we're a long way from being able to use micro-remediation and stuff to heal the tar sands, but we have to start somewhere. We have to start doing that work. And so I hope people are inspired and start that.
That's it. Floating wetlands are one of the only ways you can actually extract heavy metals out of waterways and lakes before it gets into your drinking water reservoir, before it gets into the ocean. And the reason for that is the root zones are very sticky. They have algal and bacterial biofilms, and that's what these colloidally suspended heavy metals, it's kind of like a, like a magnet. These metals just get attracted to the, the sticky biofilm as the water passes through. So this is, this is fantastic technology. This stuff here, that's actually native uh, species that were, were, were then reintroduced. But what I've got to say is, these, the problem with these systems is they live and they die, and then the nutrients go back down into the sediment. So the floating ecosystems uh, avoid that, that issue. So this is the water before the installation, and this is the water after three months. So it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. My mission is to see 1% of every farm give over some land to a water quality improvement pond and put these systems in there. Just that alone, and we've done all the modeling, and I've worked with quite a bit in government doing really complex large scale models, and it's proven. If you just dedicate 1% of your catchment to floating wetlands, you will prevent algal blooms and ocean dead zones. 1% is not too much to ask for, and there's seriously good science to prove that. So I'll just leave that with you, thinking about Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Between the years of 1960 and the 1990s, um, at the time it was known as Texaco, formerly known as Chevron, um, opened up the pristine Amazon and um, for oil exploration. And as a result, there's over a thousand unlined contaminated pits um, filled with formation water, um, which at the time, 10 years prior, Texaco themselves actually discovered the, um, the machinery to re-inject all that formation chemical water back into the earth. Um, 10 years later in Ecuador, they did not implement their technology. It, uh, apparently it was cheaper for them to form these unlined pits and dump out the formation water with crude petroleum. Um, and so as a result, throughout the provinces of Sucumbios and Oriana, there's over a thousand unlined pits that to this day, over the past 50 years, every time it rains, which is a lot in the rainforest, it's daily, uh, those pits rise with water and they, um, every pit has, has properly a tube planted into it so that they can uh, over spill it to the streams. There's lots of programs that are already happening. Um, the Clinica Ambiental gives free permaculture courses throughout the region, and with the Environmental Reparations Committee, we want to do permaculture-based bioremediation um, courses, and um, I have a, a mushroom cultivation laboratory in the region, in Lago Agrio, where we've been doing different courses and capacity building programs. Um, and there's um, just a bunch, a lot of opportunities to collaborate between local organizations and international organizations. And the social structure is there. The committees are there, wanting to take this information into their into their own hands. So, uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>